Okay. All right, so uh, my name is Adam Cuellar. I'll be presenting uh, VoxelNet um, by Yin Zhao and Ansel Tussel. Uh, they work at Apple. Uh, so here's an overview of what I'll be reviewing today. We'll talk about the VoxelNet architecture, the training data, the results, and some ideas I had for improvement. So VoxelNet was developed for 3D object detection. It does so by processing LiDAR data into equally spaced 3D voxels, where each voxel represents a group of points in the 3D space. Each, vo each voxel is then encoded using the voxel feature encoding layers, and then passed to a group of convolutional layers prior to our region proposal network, which predicts our 3D bounding box. As I mentioned previously, the input to VoxNet is LiDAR data. Uh, LiDAR data is a point cloud of individual points, which are generated using lasers that reflect from the surface of the objects in a 3D environment. The time it takes for the laser to reflect off the object and return to the receiver determines the range of the object. And so you can imagine that, that when there are no objects, you'll have no input. And therefore the point clouds are often very sparse and contain over a hundred thousand points. Um, so if we wanted to use all this data at once, it'd be very computationally expensive. In the past to overcome this issue, handcrafted features were used. Uh, for example, the images on the right show the input to a framework called MultiView 3D Object Detection, which was one of the high performing arch architectures for 3D, 3D object detection at its time. Uh, image A shows the handcrafted features from the bird's eye view. Image B shows the features from the front view and C is the RGB image. So for VoxNet, if we're given an input of shape D by H by W, we can divide that space into a grid of 3D voxels with shape VD by VH by VW. And as you can see on the image on the right, each voxel will then contain a variable number of points. Uh, to utilize the data efficiently, the authors propose randomly sampling T points from each one of the non-empty voxels prior to the VFE layer. For each point, the authors check if the corresponding voxel already exists to, to avoid duplicate samples. This is done using a lookup operation, which uses a hash table where the voxel coordinate is used as the hash key. If the voxel is already initialized and the point is added to the voxel location, and if there are less, uh, if there are less than T points, otherwise the point is ignored. So the voxel feature encoding layer is the main contribution of this paper. Um, this layer is what set apart VoxelNet from previ previous work and introduced the idea of the end-to-end -end learning instead of using handcrafted features. The voxel feature encoding layer was built to encode the randomly sampled points by using a fully connected network, max pooling, and point-wise concatenation. The ram randomly sampled points are passed to the fully connected network, which is made up of a linear layer, a batch normalization layer, and a ReLU layer. Uh, the max pooling then takes the output of the fully connected network and is performed element-wise, which aggregates information from all the features into a single representation. The aggregated features are then repeated and concatenated to the point-wise features, which you can see in the image on the top right. This process is repeated for each non-empty voxel and the authors use several stacked VFE layers. Uh, the output to the VFE layer is C by uh, D by H by W, which is a 4D tensor, which looks like the image in the bottom right. After the voxel Sorry, feature- Sorry, could you please explain what the color, if you come back to the previous slides, you see, like, uh, yeah. when, uh, I think it's better for you to explain. You see, like, the, the author, I think he intentionally puts a different color for different points, right? Yeah. Same explain this a little so other people can follow up. Yeah, so if we look here, we have uh, in the grouping different voxels. And so right here, uh, each one of those colors represents the uh, encoded feature from the, the voxel that we saw previously. So each one represents a different voxel. Oh, I mean, the point-wise input, if you look at the, like the figure, like in, in the uh, like oh, upward, like you see like uh, I have the part? different, uh, yeah, yeah. So you see oh, okay. like we have different, uh, for example, the blue point, we have a blue line here, just to explain what does it mean? Oh yeah, so these are the randomly sampled points from the voxel. So each one of these is the uh, the data at that point. So the mm -hmm. X, Y, Z um, coordinate and um, the value there. Yeah, so they just, you know, put every point into a vector and concatenate it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, 
So after the voxel feature encoding layer, uh, the encoded voxel information is processed through the convolutional middle layers. Um, each layer is a 3D convolution with a batch normalization and a ReLU layer. Uh, the goal of this part of the architecture is to aggregate voxel-wise features while progressively expanding the receptive field of the network. Uh, so depending on the task, the details of the convolutional layers are different, uh, including the filters, stride, et cetera. Uh, for the car detection task, you can see the set of convolutional middle layers in the image below. Um, each layer has the same number of filters in stride. However, the padding is different. And then this is different for the uh, pedestrian and cyclist detection as well. So after the convolutional middle layers, the features are passed to a region proposal network. Um, a region proposal network is used to predict the bounding boxes, and a popular use of this architecture was for the 2D object detection with uh, FAST or FAST RCNM, um, which was a state-of-the-art 2D object detection at the time. And so that same region proposal network is used and adapted for VoxelNet. So prior to the region proposal network, um, the features must be reshaped into a 3D sensor. And after reshaping, the region proposal network uses a 2D uses 2D convolutions to further process this data. Uh, the features are downsampled, and then a skip connection is used from each one of the blocks that you see in the image below um, to the output, which are upsampled to the same size and then concatenated. Uh, you can see uh, in the image that after the that concatenation, there's um, it gets split into two portions: a regression map and a probability score map. Um, the regression map is for the bounding boxes and the probability score map is for detecting whether an object is present or not. So for training, uh, VoxelNet was trained on the LiDAR data from the Kitty data set. Uh, the Kitty data set was, uh, has data for car, pedestrian and cyclist detection. Um, when training VoxelNet, the authors had two variations of the network one for the car detection and the other for the pedestrian and cyclist detection. Car detection task only required one anchor, uh, whereas the pedestrians and cyclist class required two. Uh, the other main difference is that the region proposal network for the pedestrian and cyclist detection is modified for finer resolution by changing the stride size of the first convolution from uh, a stride of two to a stride of one. Uh, for data augmentation, the authors had three separate online methods. Uh, so the first included rotating and shifting the bounding boxes as individual pieces within the point cloud. Um, and to avoid physically impossible outcomes, they used a collision test between the boxes after perturbation. Um, if a collision was detected, then the data is reverted to the original setup. Um, otherwise, then it's uh, kept as it is. Uh, so the second method of the data augmentation was global scaling, which includes multiplying the entire point cloud by some scale factor. And then the last tool was a global rotation of the point cloud where the data is rotated along the z-axis. Uh, so you can also think of the random sampling from each of the voxels as a sort of data augmentation, since the data the network sees for each point is slightly different every time it pulls that point from the voxel. And so each network is then trained using stochastic gradient descent with a learning rate of 0.01 for uh, 150 epochs, and then 0 0.001 for another 10 epochs. Uh, the image on the right is just an example of what the Kitty data looks like with some of the bounding boxes. So to train the network, uh, the loss function incorporates the predicted bounding box, as well as whether an object is part of the foreground or the background. Um, this, can, this is considered a positive or negative and is predicted as a probability for each one. Uh, for the bounding box, the network predicts an offset of the positive anchor, parameterizes the X, Y, Z coordinate, as well as the length, width, height, and rotation of the box. The offset for each parameter is calculated using the equations on the bottom left. Uh, the X and Y predictions are normalized using that diagonal of the bottom face of the anchor, or DA, in those equations. And the Z coordinate is normalized by the height of the anchor and the length width and height are the log of the prediction over the anchor measurement. Uh, so the probability of being a positive or negative prediction is refined using the cross entropy loss with alpha and beta parameters, which uh, help balance uh, each prediction accordingly. And the bounding box is refined using the smooth L1 loss function, which is similar to what was used uh, in 2D object detection for fast R or fast RCNN. Um, the reason the smooth L1 clock a smooth L1 loss function is used is because it's less sensitive to outliers when compared to like the L2 or MSE loss. And it also helps prevent exploding gradients. 
Uh, so overall, uh, Voxelnet performs well in the Kitty data set. Uh, the, the Kitty data set is split into three uh, I'm sorry, I think you're going so fast for the previous slide. Could you please go oh. back and uh, let's uh, explain this. Sorry, uh, yeah, this one. So like uh, the, I still not follow here the, the loss function. Could you explain in detail like what is exactly the loss function and why you update the parameter like this? Yeah, so the, the first one here is the, uh, it, it measures the prediction of the network, uh, which says it's either a, uh, there is a object here or not. So that's why positive or negative. Um, so that's just the cross entropy uh, between the network's prediction and whether that object is present or not. So right? this PI, like this PI positive, is that a scalar, like the output of the network? Yeah, it's a probability. Or um, or for so each, like, yeah, the probability is that for each point or for like the whole image? Do you look at the whole image, like whole? Sorry, whole cloud point, or only only look at one point? Either this point belongs to some object or not? Uh, it's I believe it's one point. You think it's one point? So this i is the index for the point. Uh, let me let me think about it. Um, I guess it, it, no, it can't be the point because then um, you'd have to have a, a prediction here for every single one of the uh, points in the voxel, which the height and width here wouldn't match since it's divided by two. So um, I would say it'd be for every pixel that comes out in, in each one of these outputs, but I don't think it corresponds to every single point. So I think it's uh, corresponding to the whole like box, right? Yeah. So for like each the, box, the grid. So, the, so this i is the index for the box because you see like first you divide it into a little box and each box contains several points in it. So, yeah, so yeah. I think it's for each one of those. Each one of the box. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. um, then they weight that uh, with an alpha break. How about the other one? Break. What is this LREG? Is, is that the so that yeah, that's the regression map that we regression. talked about before, right? So that regression map is what predicts the uh, bounding box position, um, which what is, is this defined. What is here? U, U, is the, U is the set of uh, values here, X, Y, ah, Z, okay. uh, yeah, this vector here. And then um, UI is the uh, those offsets that we talked about here. So what it's is comparison. That? What is this U, UI, UI star here? So what is this? That's like the ground truth. But instead of being the actual uh, position of the bounding box, it's an anchor. And so it's predicting a um, an offset of that anchor. So it's basically ensuring. Yeah, but how do, you, how do you get the ground truth of it? I mean, do um, you have ground truth for each point here? I think I think they have the ground truth, yes, but the, it's based off the uh, the anchor that they choose in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So the anchor is always the same, okay. um, and then they do. Uh, I don't know why my mouse keeps disappearing, but mm -hmm. yeah, that that anchor um, is then uh, the, each object mm -hmm. an anchor. Uh, the offsets are calculated using that anchor that they chose at the beginning. Okay. Yeah. Let me see. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that regression loss is the smooth L1 loss function, mm -hmm. which uh, is just comparing the offsets that the network predicts to the offset of the ground truth. Why do they need this term? The regression? Yeah. Uh, so to refine the bounding box prediction. So that, that's how the network learns to predict the offsets of the anchor for each object. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, yeah. So yeah, please continue. Yeah, I think this page you still need to like explain like uh, every term in detail. Why do we need that? What does it mean? Right? Yeah, in, in your report, just to put everything in like in more details there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Please continue. Uh, okay. So where was I? Um, so as I said, uh, it performs pretty well. Um, it's split into three categories: the easy, moderate, and hard. And in order to emphasize, 
emphasize the importance of the end-to-end -end learning. The authors also report the results of a network which they call the HC baseline. And so this HC baseline is a, a similar architecture to Voxelnet, but it uses handcrafted features as the input instead of the encoding the uh, voxel information through the VFE layers. So at the time, Voxelnet became the new state of the art in 3D object detection and outperformed all the previous work. Um, and the table shows the results of those networks on each one of the categories and for each detection task. So here you can see some of the qualitative results of Voxelnet. Um, you can see that the network actually detects the cars, pedestrians, and cyclists in each of their respective images. And so uh, some ideas I had for improvement is that I think the prediction of both positive and negative is a bit redundant. Um, it could be replaced with a single value where a threshold determines whether the object is a positive or negative prediction. Um, and at the time, most networks for 2D and, ob and 3D object detection predicted both object or no object. Uh, however, more recent work only uses one value. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is like uh, the YOLO 2D object detection network. It used to predict objectness and no objectness. Um, but then it was switched to one value. Um, another improvement could be made by using self-supervised representation learning, which seems to be the current state of the art on the Kitty data set. Um, I'm curious as to how Voxelnet can benefit from something like that. Um, another idea I had was to replace the Voxel feature encoding layers with a transformer encoder layer. I think the uh, self-attention mechanism and the transformer encoder, encoder would help provide more insight to the network about which uh, points are related to one another uh, within, one in, within one voxel. And I also believe the network could be modified to provide an output for both the detection scenarios. Um, the way it was designed was specific to either the car or pedestrian and cyclist detection. So you have to have two networks uh, to do both. Uh, however, I think that the network can be modified to produce a detection for both by using multiple anchors. Um, I think this would help the network with generalization by forcing it to understand the discrepancies between the types of the 3D objects instead of just focusing on one or the two classes. Uh, so any questions? <laughs>